Thanks so much for coming today. Our webinar will begin shortly. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on managing your online presence. My name is David Brelo, Vice President for, Ac for Development at the Council of Independent Colleges, which is happy to join with the other associations and with the AQ team in bringing you this webinar series on effective online instruction. First, we hope that you're well and that you're holding up during this very challenging time. We thank you for all you're doing to keep higher education on task and for joining this conversation with us today. And we want to thank AQ, with whom CIC has collaborated on an earlier endeavor in support of faculty teaching, for putting this important series together to support faculty members across the country as they engage their students in new ways. And now I'll turn things over to Kim Middleton, Academic Director at AQ, who will facilitate our conversation today. Thank you so much, David. Welcome to all of you from all of us here at the Association of College and University Educators. Today marks the second installment in our webinar series, and I'm privileged today to be joined by three incredibly thoughtful, creative, and compassionate pedagogy experts who are really just leaders in our field. They'll start us off on our conversation on today's topic, managing your online presence. Before I introduce them and get started, however, I just want to quickly review our agenda for the hour. First, our presenters will briefly discuss the context for this topic of online presence. What exactly do we mean by that term and why is it important? And then how do we create it in our classes? We think it'll be valuable whether you're in your first or your fourth week of your online experience. Then the majority of today's session, about 35 minutes, is reserved for discussion, led by the questions that you submit to our panelists. Our goal is to have an interactive conversation that focuses on this topic and that continues to provide practical ideas and suggestions for your online teaching. So a quick word about how to then pose your questions. So please go ahead and use that Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. As you do, you might see that somebody else has already submitted one that's similar to yours. If that's the case, you can go ahead and use that thumbs up symbol to highlight that question. It'll save you some typing, but it also helps us prioritize the questions that have the most interest. And then finally, don't forget the chat room window. We'll use that as a sort of one way information space to provide references and resources that come up during our discussion today. If you have technical difficulties, please go ahead and email webinar at aq.org for assistance. Towards the end of the hour, we'll share how we can continue our conversation at our online discussion board and share some additional resources to support your teaching. And that will also be the place where you can view a recording of this session. So the topic for today's webinar, and for those that follow in this series, were really inspired by the free resources recent, recently published by AQ in our online teaching toolkit. Many of you responded to that kit by telling us that you wanted to hear more, more from our experts and more from each other about these six topics. So that's why we're here today and we'll continue to engage in this conversation in upcoming sessions and in the webinar discussion boards. So now, without further ado, let's meet our experts. Joining us today are Flower Darby, author of How to Be a Better Online Teacher, Kevin Gannon, author of Radical Hope, A Teaching Manifesto, and April Mondi, Instructor in Management at Delta State University. I'm so excited to hear these three start our discussion on this topic. Before coming to AQ, I taught digital humanities projects at the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York, and I've published on the pedagogy of that work with my students. 
we're in a time, however, where that term presence is taking on completely new meaning for all of us. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing the insights that our experts have to offer. So I think we should get to it. So welcome to our experts. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, and Flower, I think you had graciously agreed to start us off this morning. Absolutely. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. And I do thank everyone for taking the time. I know how pressed we all are for time right now. I also want to echo David's uh, wishes that you're doing as well as, as is possible. You know, we did really want to start off with thinking about what is online presence. For people who are new to teaching online, it, it may not make very much sense. How do we engage and be present with our online students? So I thought it would be helpful to start today with this community of inquiry framework to ground our discussion. This framework came out of robust research that took place in the late 90s. A team of researchers assessed what goes into effective computer mediated instruction, as we called it then. And they came up with this framework, which has been uh, tested and replicated um, over time. Again, that, that, came, that research came out in 2000. We've now had 20 years to um, experiment with it and see how this works. So I'm just going to give a high level overview of this framework, including my own personal modification to it based on more recent research. The team of researchers found that in order to have good online classes, you needed three main presences. They called them three main ingredients, I like to think. And they're depicted here on the screen. The first one is cognitive presence. That's the intellectual work that is taking place in the class. The uh, cognitive processes, I also like to think of this as the planning that you as the faculty member do as you're creating the class, the design, and then how are students interacting with and learning new information in the class. The second presence they defined was essential is the teaching presence. And that is the guiding and the facilitating of student co-creation of knowledge, co-construction of new information. But I will say, I think in those past 20 years, we're, we're still trying to figure out what online teaching is, what that teaching presence involves. And that's one of the reasons that we're here with you today to, to continue to explore how to be an effective online teacher. There's a third component, which to me is almost more important than the other two, and that is the social presence. How are we interacting with our students as people? It can be so easy to just forget that that name and that avatar, or worse yet, that little gray silhouette of a head, is actually a person. And the, the screen and the remoteness of online teaching really, um, I should say, intensifies that inherent distance that can happen. But we know, and we're all experiencing it right now with social distancing, we know the importance of engaging with people, especially when we're feeling particularly isolated. So the social presence is a very important how, aspect for me. How are we engaging with each other as people in our online classes? But now there's a circle around the original framework that those three circles in the center, that was the original framework proposed by Garrison Archer and colleagues Anderson as well. And this um, emotional presence is something that was proposed in about um, 2012, I think 2012, by Marty Cleveland Inns in um, arguing that there was room for a fourth presence, the emotional presence. And I've really thought a lot about this argument, which is to say that we, we uh, there's a lot of emotion in our teaching and learning in online spaces. There, there is in an in-person class as well, but let's not forget that the emotions impact everything that we do in online classes. And so together with some colleagues at Northern Arizona University, I have proposed that the emotional presence kind of suffuses the whole thing. That's why the circle wraps around the original framework. It, it impacts everything we do. I want to end uh, with just one quick way that I demonstrate high impact communication and that's what we're here to talk about today is high impact. How do we get the most bang for our buck as we're trying to be with our students? I got this idea from Michelle Pekansky Brock who's doing great work in this space. And it's about just asking your students if they choose to share with you what challenges they're dealing with in their life outside of your online class. 
Now more than ever, students are managing so many challenges and stresses and anxieties. You could create a very short, simple survey that could be anonymous, or you could invite students to self-disclose, completely optional. Tell me what's going on in your life so that if you need a little help or support, I'm aware already that things are happening. I'm gonna leave it at that right now. We'll have plenty of time to talk about other strategies and turn this over to our next panelist. Thanks. Thanks so much, Flower. Um, before we move on, Kevin or April, is there anything you wanna add or does that bring up anything for you? I'd like to, to just sort of call out and really lift up the point that Flower made about reaching out to our students with some easy sort of check-in or survey. Um, it's a really effective way, especially in this sort of uncertain environment where a lot of our students are feeling really anxious about being in a type of class that they didn't exactly sign up for. Uh, it's, it's important for us, I think, to sort of take gauge of that and to also signal uh, that you know, we're aware that, again, these are weird times for everybody. And so we want to try to do our best to meet people where they are. And I think it sends a really important signal and, again, starts to model that sort of presence uh, that's so important. I agree, particularly when um, Flower mentioned that sometimes we forget there is a student behind that silhouette, that avatar in the LMS, but kind of gauging where the students are can kind of help give us a good reminder that we're not the only ones that are dealing with the adjustments, the students are as well, but that also kind of helps give us an idea of how we need to be modifying and making adjustments. If I'm seeing that I have a lot of students that are struggling with internet access, I might need to relax some of my deadlines or rethink about the types of assignments I'm giving. So it can kind of help give us some information as far as how we need to be structuring things moving forward. Thanks so much, April. And that might lead actually nicely into what you wanted to talk about. Exactly. Well, um, thank you for um, having me to be here. So if we were talking about planning a course months in advance with a, you know, really sophisticated design, obviously our context would be different. Some of the strategies that we talk about would be different. Um, but considering that we are all essentially in survival mode and we're trying to get through the semester, we're all having to make adjustments. Um, I would like to narrow my specific focus on the communication aspect because communication is very important when you're dealing with uncertainty. Indies. And as you can see on my slide, I have four, four very quick strategies that I would like to recommend as far as how to model communication with your students in this unfamiliar and uncertain time. Um, so communication should be transparent, empathetic, proactive, and consistent. So with transparent, um, just like we need our students, we have to be flexible and understanding and patient with them. They need to be flexible and patient and understanding with us as well. And I think this is a good time for them to see the human aspect that we also have to deal with. So even if it's something like saying to the students, hey, I know this is your first time in an online environment, you didn't sign up for this, you know, this is my first time as well, but we're going to get through it. It's not showing weakness or, or incompetence, it's letting the students know that this is something that is affecting all of us. And it's the time where we can give each other permission to cut each other a break, essentially. Uh, being empathetic, uh, student anxiety levels are at an all-time high. Our courses are one more thing that they have to worry about and it's important when we communicate with them that we convey understanding and that we convey that we are willing to work with them. You know students have limited access to resources now. They can't go to the computer lab. They can't go to the library. Some of them are at home sharing one computer with other family members and it's creating a lot of stress for them. Um, so every time we communicate with them we need to be reassuring them that we understand what they're dealing with we understand what that they're what they're going through and we're going to work through them you know I had students email me apologizing that they missed assignments because they didn't have access to the internet uh, so we need to constantly convey that that empathy to put their minds at ease and then dealing with being proactive um, anticipating what questions or concerns our students might already be thinking about um, so for instance if you were doing a major presentation at the end of the semester on 
on research that the students have been working on all semester, they're probably wondering about that. So, you know, even if you don't have the answer, letting them know, you know, acknowledging that can put their minds at ease and it'll cut back on all of the emails that you'll get bombarded with. So something like, hey students, I know you're probably wondering about that research presentation. I'm still determining what that's going to look like, but I will update you as soon as I have that, you know, determined. Thank you for your patience. Also, if one student emails you with a question, email the entire class with the answer because more than likely other students are asking that question or have that question as well. And that cuts down also on a lot of the communication. Lastly, uh, being uh, consistent. Uh, our students have gone from having no or one or only a couple of online classes to being all online. It's a lot for them to keep up with and it can get overwhelming. They can get classes mixed up. The more consistent we can be, the more that helps them to stay on track. So whether it's sending an email at the beginning of the week with everything that's coming up, doing a midweek reminder, um, however you want to model your communication, the students need to know when they log into your class what to look for and when to look for it and that consistency will help them stay on track and it'll also help you to stay on track as well so those four things can really help as far as communicating with the students in this context of our post-migration period and trying to get through the semester those are great thanks april i saw uh, flower and kevin doing a lot of head nodding so i want to make sure that they have some room to respond I'll jump in. Um, first of all, I loved every single thing that you said, April. It's all so spot on. And that is why, yes, I was really um, <laughs> exuberantly here hearing everything that you said. But I do want to um, highlight the importance and the value of one to many communication mm -hmm. instead of one to one communication. And I think we'll be talking more about that today. When you do communicate with your students, which is the best way really to be present with them in this time, you do want to be very efficient about how you do that. And so again, I'm sure we'll um, explore additional options for how, but just thinking about being strategic and efficient and yet providing a, a robust level of communication for all of your students. I think that's really important right now. Everything that, that both of you have said is something I would enthusiastically agree with, of course. Um, and I'd, I'd like to particularly uh, not emphatically, if I can, uh, April, to your discussion of transparency. That's such an important component of everything that we're doing, uh, especially when we're now in an environment that's a little more depersonalized, a lot less synchronous, or perhaps completely asynchronous. All of the things that we depend on usually in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom, you know, the ability for students to just interject a question, vocal inflections, things like that, all of those little cues that we usually use are gone. And so we have to be as transparent and as explicitly and mindfully so as we can uh, in order to help put our students at ease, in particular ones who are struggling with either access to or proficiency with some of the technology, whether it's a learning management system or video conferencing software that we're asking them to use. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and I feel like you all have beautifully figured this out. And now we're going to hand it off to Kevin to say more <laughs> about how best to go forward. Well, I've got one particular uh, sort of specific strategy, um, and it's a really simple thing that we can fold into our courses if we haven't done so already, that gets at some of the things that both Flower and April have talked about in terms of transparency, in terms of empathy, and in, in terms of kind of modeling the type of presence that we can get after in these next few weeks of our courses. And that's to create what I call a parking lot, uh, a place to sort of park things that might not be germane to course content or specific discussions or things that we're having our students do, but items of discussion and conversation that need to happen anyway. Uh, so I'm on a campus that uses Blackboard as our learning management system, and this is a screenshot of part of a forum that I create on Blackboard for all my online courses and that I've done now that I've transitioned my face-to-face -face courses online too, where it's basically, hey, got a question? If so, post it here. Uh, and there's a few different reasons that, that I would recommend this uh, if, if you're not doing it already. Um, especially in the weird times that we're in now, we're going to be answering a lot of questions from students. It can feel like that we're basically an IT or LMS help desk more than anything else. One way to sort of make this practice a little more efficient is to have our students post their questions on this Blackboard forum. Uh, 
And what I tell my students, even if they email a question to me, I'll ask you, can you please post that on the questions forum or in the parking lot? Because chances are, if you've got a question, several other folks in the class probably have the same question. And so it'll do, it's better for me to be able to answer you all at once. Uh, but what I don't tell the students is this also saves me from writing the same email 15 or 18 times in the next couple of days. And again, you know, things that can help make our workflow more efficient uh, are, are things that we should be thinking about in this particularly hectic time. What it also does, though, is it gives us a chance to kind of model the type of presence uh, that we want students to be doing in these digital spaces. Here's a really easy way to jump on a discussion board, to make a post, to see what other people are posting, a really nuts and bolts, you know, low stakes to no stakes kind of way of getting people started in a particular online forum. And so if you're using discussion forums and you're using sort of written or text-based discussions as part of your new online incarnation of your class, this is a really easy on-ramp for students who don't necessarily have the experience maybe in this type of space. What it also does is it lets you model a couple of the features of the discussion boards that could be useful too. Blackboard, Canvas, Desire to Learn, your major learning management systems. When you create a forum and the, whatever the discussion board pace looks like, you could actually subscribe and have students subscribe to that forum. So you can see in the screenshot here, I've already subscribed to this. On the left, you can see the option if I wanted to unsubscribe. What that does is anytime a student posts something on this forum, I get an email. Uh, giving the student's name and that they've posted. And so that alerts me that there's a question waiting to be answered that I can get in and do. Um, there is a temptation to make it sort of Pavlovian. You know, I get the email and dang, oh, I better get in the discussion board. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way, but it does let me get in in a timely fashion. And also letting students know that they can subscribe to discussions. You know, say they are responsible for leading a discussion thread one week and replying to those who are leaving comments. Well, a subscription feature might be a really good way for them to be able to be timely and keep on top of those things as well. The the idea of creating, again, just this sort of low to no stakes space to alleviate the type of immediate anxieties that come out of this pivot to online teaching, I think is a really useful one, whether you do a parking lot question uh, discussion board or something else. I think it's important for us to show our students again that, you know, we understand that this is, this is quite an abrupt pivot. It's not the best option. It's the least worst option that we have at this point. And so doing the things like transparency and showing empathy and offering to help, you know, I'm here if you have these sort of specific questions, what are the barriers? What are the obstacles in your way that we can take care of right now? And it also models to other students too. And I think this is one of the most important aspects of it that they're not alone. Uh, if they have a particular issue or, uh, you know, tech related problems. So if they see one of their peers post a question and say, oh, that's the exact same question I have. And I thought I was the only one who couldn't figure this out. Well, now we sort of affirm that this is something that we're all trying to navigate together. So one easy, discreet, uh, you know, low effort tool uh, to put in there, but one that I think sets an important tone and models some important things as our students and ourselves navigate this new space together. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, April and Flower, is there stuff there that resonates with you? Yes, I think it's a great idea because it allows an opportunity for student to student engagement outside of just regular coursework. Also, um, if a student has a solution, you know, they might provide an idea that's something that we hadn't thought about. So it's a good, a good opportunity for them to feed each other ideas. But there have been plenty of times in student forums when a student would give it an idea and I would write that down and use it for the next time. So I think that's a great resource for student to student engagement and just for resources for us. Yeah, and I'll just jump in. I think your, um, your focus here, Kevin, is eminently practical and really pretty low tech and easy for folks who are new to online teaching to learn how to use the discussion forum can be a great tool. I did want to also um, add to what April was just saying in terms of student to student communication. You know, there could be lots of reasons that your students may hesitate to email you specifically. There could be cultural reasons or preferences or things going on. Students may feel vulnerable about revealing. They may feel insecure that they don't know. But um, this is a form of providing both culturally relevant pedagogy and also universal design for learning when you encourage students to jump in and answer other students in that space when you um, make everybody feel welcome and comfortable and unafraid to post there. It, it's just a way to 
demonstrate caring and support for all of the students who are in our classes. Well, thank you for the th for, to all three of you for getting us started with a really sort of broad and deep set of ideas just to kind of launch the conversation. I can sort of see that these questions are coming in fast and furious. So I think what we'll go ahead and do is toggle to the questions that are coming in from people. Um, I see, let's see, if we look, I, I love this question and it's sort of floated to the top um, that, um, if you had to pick one in caps, one strategy for presence, what would it be? No pressure. Uh, for me, it would be, boy, one is tough, but <laughs> I, uh, oh, can I have two? I'll, I'll say one and then let's see if April and Kevin say my other one. Uh, one that we haven't talked about yet today that is really very powerful is the announcement tool. Um, some, it, some learning management systems allow you to click settings so that students can receive that as an email directly to them. I think Canvas, if I'm not mistaken, students can elect to get a text message when there are updates. So you, the announcement tool is again a very low tech, simple um, function to use. It works similar to an email and can be a great way to give that one to many communication. Another thing with the announcement tool is you can schedule your announcements to post at a later date. I mean, there have been times when I'd be working on an announcement, you know, at 1130 at night, but I don't want, you know, notifications to go to students at that time. So I would schedule for the announcement to go out the next morning, sometimes even days in advance. And that's very helpful. So I agree with uh, Flower, definitely the announcement tool. I'm actually going to do two because I'm a rule breaker. Uh, so the first, but the first one is really, is really, again, kind of a small thing, but an important one. Um, I think we ought to make clear right up front, you know, what can our students expect from us in terms of communication? So if a student emails me, what should they expect in terms of me being able to get back to them, right? Uh, you know, I think that's important for two reasons. One, it prevents a student from emailing me and then half an hour later, hey, did you get my email? And then 15 minutes later, hey, did you get those two emails that I sent, right? If I've said right off the bat, you know, give me 24 hours to respond. And if you haven't heard back from me, then you can start bugging me. It makes that expectation clear. And it also helps us as faculty, uh, you know, manage our workflow. You know, again, we shouldn't, you know, I made the Pavlov joke earlier, but it's very easy when we see these things come up to immediately jump and answer them. Uh, and that's not necessarily healthy either. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we're maintaining our boundaries and balance and not just, you know, an email receive and return machine all day. Uh, the second thing I'll mention uh, is anytime that we have a chance to use either audio, video, or both in our communication with students, whether it's feedback on different assignments or assessments, maybe even in discussion boards, posting brief videos, and encouraging our students to do the same. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this depending upon the type of tools you have and your background and experience. Um, but even just recording audio files and sending students a link to that file out of a shared folder in Google Drive, for example, hearing us and maybe even seeing us uh, adds that depth to that sort of social presence that Flower was talking about that can be really useful, especially when students tend to feel like all of a sudden they've been disaggregated and disembodied from their educational experience. I agree. And for the Canvas users out there, um, all of my announcements are videos. Um, there is a built-in multimedia feature where you literally just hit the button. It starts recording. You don't have to have an additional software and, um, and it posts right there. And what I'll do is I'll put the video up there because I quickly figured out students were not going to read a super long announcement. So in addition to the video, I will put text below it with some highlights of maybe important dates or some really important things that students need to remember. So they are seeing my face, they're hearing my voice, and then they have the option to read as well. And if you're a Blackboard campus, there is a quick way in the Blackboard text editor to record audio comments as well. So clearly our attendees are really thinking about this question of prioritizing and, and, and screening things because the next question is, can we overwhelm students with communication? In other words, in an online environment, what is the balance between communicating enough and over communicating and making it a burden for students to keep up with? And then, of course, the associated question, which is, how do we avoid email burnout for ourselves? Mm -hmm. So any part of that that you'd like to take a whack at, please. I'll jump on that first. Um, I think it's important, first of all, to communicate to the students 
how you're going to communicate. So if you are going to do weekly announcements, let them know that every Monday morning, look for an announcement from me or every Wednesday, a midweek reminder. Um, if you want the students to communicate with you through the LMS inbox, let them know that. If you want them to email you from their university email address, uh, you know, some professors have more informal methods of communication and they might use GroupMe Whatever the communication method is going to be, the students need to know that up front. And then I think it's important to have a uh, pattern. So once a week, twice a week, three times a week, however often, if there is a pattern, the students know what the expectation is. So it's not like they keep randomly getting emails. And then that also kind of helps keep us on track as well. I know that I don't have to respond to that right now. I'll put that in my midweek email tomorrow. And that kind of helps build a little bit more of a structure. So having a pattern, having set times, and then communicating that to the students. Um, every Wednesday, they're on the lookout for this. So if, a if you have two or three emails that come in on Tuesday, they know they'll get the answer in that Wednesday morning midweek email. I love everything you said there again, April. Um, I feel like we're going to be BFFs after today, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a really valid question. And I do think a lot of faculty are drowning in efforts to communicate well with students right now. I certainly have been in the situation before of my students accusing me of spamming them. And of mm -hmm. course, the danger there is they stop reading or they stop watching. Um, so it is really important to get that balance. For me, one of the tools that I have found extremely useful is um, a tool called Remind. You can go to remind.com and it's a way to send anonymous text messages to your students. You can create a class and I'll be honest, I learned about this first from my daughter's teachers in elementary school. Um, so it's being widely used in K-12, but it works great for us too. And what I've kind of landed on with this tool is I make it an opt-in feature. So if there are students who know that they want a little more frequent nudging or reminding, um, they can choose to sign up for my Remind, and then they receive text messages from me. Um, but it, like I said, I, I have made it uh, required before, and some students don't prefer that level of communication. So maybe thinking creatively about how you um, give students ways to opt in to, to more communication, that, that might be another thing to consider as well. And I'll echo April's point too about the structure and making that explicit and intentional with our students. And I'm a humanities guy, so the idea of structure and standardization kind of makes you know my soul want to rebel. But when you're teaching fully online and either completely or mostly asynchronous, there is a rhythm to a course that can provide the type of structure that will help students, especially students who are new to online learning, be more successful. And so again, knowing that you know, the, the end or the beginning of the week or the beginning of the module announcement is going to hit on early Monday. I'm going to check back in three days after that, and then I'll do something right towards the end to remind everyone of due dates for particular assignments, et cetera. Those are really, that's a really useful thing to put in place. Again, providing some sort of structure in our current moment where maybe students are feeling the lack of structure, uh, you know, from their regular schedules that they had before all of this hit. Uh, in terms of our own workflow, though, yeah, it's easy for us to drown in emails, too. Um, you know, Zoom fatigue is a thing. You know, my campus is still meeting via Zoom for a lot of the committees I'm on, and there's a different kind of tired that comes out of video conferencing every day. I think the same is true for email. Um, so setting aside specific time slots on your calendar uh, where you're going to do nothing but process and reply to email. Go through the inbox prioritize what needs to be answered, file stuff away for reference, whatever sorts of rules that you use. I have one that if I can solve whatever the email is asking within two minutes, I just take care of it right there. If it's something that takes a little more time, I put it into a later folder and then I check that in my next email processing time to make sure I'm getting back to students. But whatever sort of system you put into place, it can be kind of quick and dirty if you want, having designated email times and then turning off the email. Mm -hmm. the rest of the, the work day uh, can be a really useful way, again, to sort of create boundaries, make sure that you're answering the things that need to get answered. But if you answer an email four hours later instead of one hour later, chances are the earth will still be rotating uh, and it helps you remain a little bit sane too. Can I add on that email question? Because again, I do think it's a real timely um, and, and sort of a perennial problem for faculty teaching online. So I love Kevin's suggestion of letting your students know, and this ties into April's point about being proactive in your communication, 
let students know when they should expect to hear back from you on, on an average basis regarding your email. I think that this still is not really happening very often. It could be flooded email inboxes. It could be that it's easy to lose the connection with the people who are in our classes when we don't see them physically in front of us. But I know that online students everywhere still get very frustrated and disappointed by a lack of email response to their, um, they need help, they are reaching out with a question for something. And it's still the case that many online students feel like they are not hearing back from their instructors. So maybe it's a process, again, communicate right up front. I should, you know, this is the time during each day of the week that I respond to student emails or I make these three weekly announcements. Love that idea, April, where I will be answering any of the questions that I have received since my last announcement. Or even maybe it's a copying and pasting a one line response to say, got your question, I have time tomorrow to answer it, stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Anything so that your students know that you're there, because I know there's been lots of research that shows that students feel like they're launching their question out into a black hole. And if, if you're not able to give even, I thought about maybe an auto response or something um, to let them know that you got it, you heard it, you'll get back to them. Um, I think these are ways to also help manage the, the email flow. Yeah, managing your email doesn't mean ignoring your email. And that's an important distinction. And so I appreciate you reinforcing that point. And one of the things that I found in my experience is that this two minute rule that I have, and I borrowed that from James Allen's Getting Things Done. It's about the only part of that system that I still use, by the way, because um, I'm just horrible at it. But this idea that, you know, if you let these sort of short things linger or things that could be short linger, the, the accumulated weight of them piles up to the point where you just avoid all of them. And about probably 50 to 60% of the student questions I get via email are those that I can write a quick answer to in under two minutes and send it back out to them. Um, so being timely with that, and then as you suggest for the more complex questions, say, you know, let me, let me think on that a little bit or gather some resources and I'll be back with you by tomorrow. Um, but acknowledging what our students are doing and acknowledging uh, that their communication is important to us is absolutely key, yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so since we all are talking about both, you know, what's going on with our students and also sort of how to how to help ourselves. Um, the next question really uh, goes back to one of the suggestions that Flower had earlier, which is about uh, surveying your students. So the question says, if you survey students, how do you handle those situations that might require more action steps like reported abuse at home? Um, how do you create boundaries around what students are sharing with you? And then whether there is a method that allows students to share information anonymously. I'll jump in on that because I think that uh, the form that I use to check in with my students already got shared in the group chat here. Um, and I use a Google form to reach out to my students to survey them basically kind of how are you doing? What, you know, anything I need to know, uh, but also, you know, what's your technology? What's your internet access? What are the tools that you have to work with? Are you still on campus? Are you at home, et cetera? Uh, so I think the link to the Google form got shared out already on the chat. Um, so it is something with the student's name on it. Um, but all of the questions I phrased intentionally as, is there anything that you want me to know about? Like always giving the student the option to say or not say the things that they think are the most relevant and important. I think we do need to be aware that sometimes students may disclose things to us. So uh, your mandatory reporter status is an important thing to be aware of. And I have also found it really useful to sort of be touching base with the counseling staff on my campus. And then so I let them know that I was doing this with my class and ask them if a student were to say something uh, that I felt like was kind of out of my league, you know, how do I connect them with you and how do I make that offer to the students? You know, well, I'm, I am certainly not qualified to be my student's therapist, but I am qualified to help my students connect to the resources they might need at this particular time. Um, and so I think that that's really important, letting the student create the space, whether they're going to answer or not answer, and then how they're going to answer on this sort of check-in form. And I use Google Forms just because it's easy uh, to send out the, yeah, I made it so only someone with the link can access the form and then I compiled the responses in my own folder. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can go at this. Um, you know, if you use GroupMe or Slack or other sorts of social media for a class channel, that might be one way too. But I liked the Google form because it was just the student to me and no one else was involved in that process. Kevin, got it. I have nothing to add. <laughs> 
this last time we just would really agree. The importance of um, understanding that you don't have to be the student's counselor. You don't have to be the expert in that situation. So um, connecting your students with those resources. I would also, I would add, okay, I found something to add, that um, especially, I think in this moment here, we have an opportunity to reflect on what we need to be doing institutionally differently moving forward. And I feel like online faculty actually are in relative close communication with their students. I would love to see institutions put more into preparing online faculty to um, deal with these unexpected and potentially highly emotionally charged or very difficult circumstances. I feel like many online faculty, again, we don't need to train them um, to, uh, to how to be a counselor or, or a mental health expert, but I think that we could be doing a little bit more to help faculty prepare for an unexpected revelation and feel equipped and empowered to deal with that individual at that time. I just wanted to give you enough time to answer, but not to force you to answer. We like to, at AQ, we really like to practice our wait time. So um, the next question is something I know that's near and dear to all of your hearts. It's again, a question about accessibility, which comes up in this situation over and over, we know. So um, the attendees are wondering if you have specific suggestions about what to do with students who don't have access to internet or computer, especially as we're talking about um, uh, instructor presence, but also student presence in these spaces. That's one of the reasons that I'm so fond of Remind, and I promise they aren't paying me to keep on mentioning them, but um, most students today have some kind of, of a cell phone or a smartphone, and I could imagine that you could even facilitate a simple text chat using something like Remind, where students might be able to uh, interact and communicate either one-to-one -one with you or with a small group or the whole class, just in, in a way that we all communicate all the time anyway. Um, I think it's a really important question and very timely on, in terms of what we're expecting students to be able to do. I'm in a very rural state and we have many students who take classes here who don't have internet right now. Um, I'll, others, Kevin, April, do you have other thoughts to add as well? Yes, I also uh, teach at a university where we have a lot of students with limited access to internet because of they live in rural areas. One of the things that I've had to do is simply relax some of my policies. I usually have a no late assignments policy and I'm a stick with for deadlines. I've had to completely throw that out the window. Um, I have had to go in and reduce some of the assignments that might have been a little bit more robust. So not compromising the integrity of their learning, but having to be just a little bit more flexible in this time, knowing that students can't just turn on the computer in the library. They, they can't go to the, uh, to the lab and some of them are only working from their phones. I had a student that emailed me because he couldn't write his paper because he only had a small tablet. Um, so just thinking about ways to uh, be a little bit more flexible with deadlines, um, with the magnitude of requirements, we really have to think about the uh, student experience right now because we don't want those requirements to be a barrier for their learning. In a normal environment, you know, they could get it done, but uh, right now we just have to be really flexible with what we're asking from them. Exactly. Um, that's I think that's the key, right? The, the ability to be flexible and compassionate and aware that our students are coming from a variety of places. I think we all have students who struggle with an internet access. You know, I teach in, in Iowa, so we're a fairly rural state, as you might have heard. Uh, but even in within the city of Des Moines, a lot of my students struggle with home internet access, for example, because the digital divide is a real thing. Uh, so maybe some of the practical sort of specific ways that you can think about it. If you're having your students do something, ask yourself, could I do this on my cell phone? Mm -hmm. um, if a student is, you know, the, the, the check-in with students, you know, surveying what kind of technology do you have access to? Do you have a laptop? Do you have a phone? Do you have a tablet? How's your Wi-Fi access? Will help you kind of think about ways that you might have to create alternate means for students to demonstrate the learning outcomes. So if a student only has a phone, can they record something rather than just writing a paper, for example? You know, there are a lot of different vehicles that we can use as students get to the learning outcomes that we have. So be willing to think about ways that they can use the tools that they have uh, if 
you know, if that's a more practical and, and honestly more humane way to go about it. Also think about the things that we're asking our students to consume in terms of course content. We don't want to have them uploading and downloading large files, for example, if they're using a cell phone data plan that's going to eat up all their data and add cost, perhaps. Um, so if we've got videos, can we give them a link where they can stream that video instead of having to download a large file? Um, are there ways that we can make sure that the there are as few barriers as possible uh, between the students and the course material that we're trying to have them access. And of course, don't be afraid to reach out to other uh, parts of your university, your department chair, your IT office, your academic affairs office. That's what we're doing here in terms of students who've reported that they don't have access to anything or they don't have internet access. Uh, so how can we do a workaround with that? You know, there are going to be those cases. Um, it's not necessarily something we can solve individually, but we do have resources at our institutions that should be working on this. I want to circle back to both, again, excellent points from April and Kevin, but I actually want to um, really emphasize the need to be flexible right now. As, as April was saying, uh, you said, April, we should be a little bit flexible. I think we need to be really flexible. I read a post from a faculty member over the weekend posting in a Facebook higher ed group, and she this, this really stuck with me. She wrote that in the past 12 hours, she had lost two of her family members and a close friend to the coronavirus. And she said, I'm just one person. All of your students might be dealing with similar in their own personal lives. This is, this is unprecedented as we've all been saying for weeks now, but the more flexibility that we can offer. I love your idea, Kevin, of just recording something on the smartphone, um, using the tools that we have available to us and understanding that we have no idea what strains and pressures every single person is under right now. Um, emphasizing that need for flexibility, I think can't be, can't be done enough. And that's part of the emotional presence that you were talking about, right, Flower? I mean, what better way to demonstrate that we are present with our students and acknowledging our own position in all of this, which in many ways is very similar to their own. And so when I suggest to my students, there are a number of ways that you can do this thing, and I want you to find the least stressful and the least demanding way for you to do it. That's not me compromising any notion of academic rigor. That's me adjusting so learning is still happening in very different circumstances. And being intentional to let my students know that I want to be flexible, I want to work with them rather than against them when it comes to doing these things, that's me being present as simply a human being in this community of learners that we've created. Love it. To that end, um, I, I think your attendees are on the same page, right? They're really thinking carefully about what, they, what their current uh, pedagogy is and sort of how to be flexible. So one of the questions that's come up really specifically thinks about um, sy the synchronous teaching. Um, and it's, I'm going to read it. I'm trying to talk around it, but let me just read it, right? Um, what is your view of the importance of students turning their cameras on during synchronous classes? I appreciate that some students do not have cameras. Some may not be comfortable sharing their home surroundings. Should turning on cameras be encouraged when these issues are not obstacles so that students can also be present? Um, or is there a better way of having a check-in in that situation? I think we should leave that choice up to our students, quite frankly. And so I do have some synchronous uh, office hour sessions and I invite my students to come into those audio, video, audio only, text only, whatever way they choose to come in. And I tell them I think presence can look a lot of different ways. And so you know the choice that that is most comfortable for you. And I think that, yeah, it's nice if you're doing a synchronous thing where everybody can see and hear, uh, you know, one another. That's certainly the optimal. But, you know, as this questioner points out, there are a lot of reasons that we might not get to the optimal. Uh, and so I think making clear to our students that this is something that, you know, as you, as your circumstances and as your um, motivations for being in here dictate, that's what you should do. Another thing is when you're doing a synchronous meetings, such as a Zoom meeting with the class, when you tell students they are required to turn their cameras on, for those that are just uncomfortable with doing that, um, they may not participate at all. Um, so the more options they have with doing what they're comfortable with, they'll be more likely to participate if they know they're not having to do something where they're required, particularly since a lot of them are at home maybe there's a lot of stuff going on in the background and there are just certain things that they don't want to go on camera. So, you know, it's actually better if we give them that option because that will discourage them from not participating altogether. And I have a practical suggestion here because this question came to us or a similar question 
came to us after our last webinar last week, which was about welcoming online students, uh, we got a lot of questions about how do you teach synchronously or, um, and the, the way that uh, question came across to us was, how do we keep students engaged when we are trying to meet with them synchronous? And, and I detect a little flavor of that in this question, like, is it better to have them on camera? There's a little bit of an accountability there. I would wholeheartedly agree with Kevin or, and April that we need to give students the choice. But here's another way to keep them engaged and accountable, which is much like um, you'll see in books like Dynamic Lecturing, um, you want to throw things out at little activities for students to engage in every few moments. And um, that might look different depending on what you're trying to accomplish. It might be every three to five minutes, it might be every five to seven minutes, but give students something quick to do. And they can do that in the text box without uh, turning on their camera. Maybe it's a quick, just a think pair chair, share where you divide the students into little breakout groups, or maybe it's a, a quick poll that you are asking students to do something. Uh, that will help them stay present with you without requiring any kind of a camera or audio for that matter as well. What if they have a, a young sibling who's crying in the background? I mean, who knows what could be happening? Mm -hmm. so. And I would also caution that presence does not directly equate to being synchronous, that there are plenty of ways for us to build presence and to maintain yeah. presence in an asynchronous environment. And I think a lot of us are learning in this particular circumstance is that doing synchronous is really hard. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't attempt to have some opportunities, um, but certainly not making them required and certainly not trying to stay to my Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one to 150, we're gonna have a Zoom meeting every week. I just don't think that's practical um, and workable. So I think that we should be thinking about how we build students' presence asynchronously. And there's a lot of ways that that can look, um, you know, but regular check-ins, discussions, having students engaging together, even if it's asynchronously on a shared project or document or something like that, those are ways to build that type of regular presence without everyone having to log in at the same time. And I think that those are uh, some things that we ought to be thinking really hard about. I do want to add on uh, real quickly. Um, again, we, um, I would think that all three of us here on the panel would argue in favor of less synchronous. Um, just generally speaking, but especially now in this moment as people are dealing with so much uncertainty. One of the things um, that we can do ties back to my earlier suggestion in terms of opt-in communications. You can certainly offer a, an optional synchronous session, a virtual office hours or a, a review session that is optional for students to come to. And then even better, you can record your uh, session, your, your review session, whatever it might be, and post that so that students can access that later if they weren't available at that particular time. Just thinking of ways to invite students to engage in the ways and times that they're able to right now. Um, there's a lot of, lot of opportunity there instead of, as Kevin said, thinking that you're gonna stick with your same class schedule. Really, I don't see that working very well right now. So I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and this one I think really kind of um, pops off the page when you look at the Q&A. We've talked so much about um, the necessity of being flexible for our students and that probably can't be said enough. Um, but there is an instructor who asks, um, what do you do when students are not willing to cut you the instructor? Some slack. And I wonder if there are some proactive or creative ways that we have to sort of encourage our students to really open up a kind of compassionate space themselves. I have something to share um, and I'll keep it brief so April and Kevin can jump in. But I really, that's a great question. And again, who knows if we ourselves might fall really sick and, and just be able to be less present. I'm gonna come back to April's first point about transparency. The more that we're willing to open up to our students and be vulnerable and let them into our lives, the more forgiving they will be. I'm thinking specifically of a, a story that I heard from a veteran online teacher who at one point, she ended up telling her online students that her mother was on her deathbed and that she, the faculty would be a little bit less available so that she could spend those last moments with her mom. Her students organized meals and brought them over to her house so that there would be one less thing for them to think about. It takes a lot of courage to be that open and that vulnerable. And I think we're kind of all in that space right now. I agree. If there is a student that is not willing to cut slack, this is just a time to remind them that, hey, 
I'm dealing with this also, um, and, and not necessarily, you know, you may not be comfortable with going into all of the details that are happening in your personal life, um, but sometimes students have a tendency to put us up on this pedestal, and they think we have it together, and they think we have all the answers, and that's kind of their perception of us, and they simply need to be reminded that this is something that we are all dealing with. We're all trying to figure this out and get through this time, uh, so I would just say that constant reminder and that constant transparency uh, to let that student know that they're not the only ones that are having to, to deal with this and and it may be you may just have to ask the student hey um, you know I appreciate you know you're, you're sharing your thoughts and whatever but you know can you be a little bit more flexible I'm trying to be flexible with you but I also need you to be flexible with me just simply directly ask the student to cut you that same slack that you're willing to cut them. Sometimes you just have to be a little bit more direct in, in asking them to be a little bit more understanding. I think April and Flower made great points there. And, and one thing I will suggest too that we think about is that, you know, our students, just as, you know, we're in this weird place, our students are in this weird place. I think our student, and, and, you know, and I've done this too in the past couple of weeks where I've written that email and sent it out. And about five minutes later, I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't have sent that email, right? That there's a little bit of a sharper edge to it, or my patience is worn a little thin. I've got a, a sixth and a ninth grader at home and, you know, we're trying to figure out what's going on, right? And so our students may be, you know, communicating less skillfully than they normally would with us. Um, I think it's important to realize, you know, my, my university has two thirds of our students are student athletes. You know, half of them had their season canceled. Our seniors are not gonna graduate in person, right? I think there is, a, you know, we're grieving what we've lost in terms of our semester and contact with our classes, maybe our research and all these other things too. Our students are grieving a lot too. And sometimes that that's gonna come out in ways that maybe nobody would have chosen first, but that's just how it did. And so as you know, we should, you know, be willing to give our students even more of the benefit of the doubt at this point. It doesn't make it easier when we feel like that they're not being very graceful to us. But I do think it is important for us as the professionals in the room to sort of keep in mind that, you know, if our student is angry or rigid, it may not be us, it may be just this larger thing. Uh, and then, move, you know, maybe tempering our tempering our response to them along those lines. Fantastic. Well, listen, I cannot thank the three of you enough for jumping in here and giving us such practical advice, but also really just thinking through what a complex moment we're at as we think about being in this online space together. Um, I know that there are a lot of questions we just didn't have a chance to get to. So just to let our attendees know at our webinar webpage, you'll be able to find a discussion board that is moderated both by those of us at AQ and also our experts over the next couple of weeks. There you'll also be able to find a recording of today's session if you'd like to view it again and a transcript. So please come ahead and visit and contribute your thoughts. We also wanna say a quick few final words about resources. So those of you who are familiar with us at the Association of College and University Educators know that our mission is student success through effective instruction. So we know that many of you might be looking for more online content that serves the varied needs of your students, which we've talked so much about today. Open educational resources, the ones that are free and don't require passwords are available in a variety of locations and a bunch of digital formats like video and worksheets and activities and assessments. Our colleagues at OpenStax are also happy to support the needs of you and your students. So we also want to say that we have um, additional resources that we reference throughout today's session and they will be available at the AQ website. Uh, there you'll also be able to find links to key resources and responses at our partners' websites. And then finally, we just want to remind you about what's coming in the future. Please join us, we hope you will, uh, for our upcoming webinars. Uh, the following topics will be covered, organizing your online courses, planning and facilitating quality discussions, recording effective micro lectures, and engaging students in readings of micro lectures. We are incredibly fortunate to be joined again, both by Flower and April, along with VG Sathi, Kevin Kelly, Luddy Goodson, Catherine Harris, Allison Snow, and others. Thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Please stay safe and have a great online class.